2020 meeting to order. Please note that Governor Kemp has extended his emergency orders until December 9th, 2020. Therefore, this meeting will continue to be held virtually uh, until further notice, and it is being held under the Open Meetings Act of Georgia. Thank you so much. Board of Commissioners, before we start, I would like to call roll District 1 Commissioner Henry Mitchell III. President. District 2 Commissioner Kelly Robinson. Present. District 3 Commissioner Terenia Carthen. Present. District 4 Commissioner Ann jones Guider. Present. Ramona Jackson Jones, Chairman. Present. Board of Commissioners, thank you so much again for being here this morning and uh, thank you public for being involved and engaged in county government. Public comment. Clerk, do we have any public comment this morning? No, ma'am. No, we do not. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on. Board of Commissioners, I'm trying to, we have, it's not robust, but it is one that is a little, it could be lengthy if I don't strategically work the meeting. Approval of the minutes, Board of Commissioners, uh, tab one through four, please be prepared to approve the minutes according to the Mara Asset to review the minutes. And then also, uh, we have a proclamation, which is tab number five tomorrow, and it will be proclaiming November 9th, 2020, live like Lisa James Lung Cancer Awareness Day in Douglas County. And that uh, proclamation will be read by Jessica Frazier. And then also we have a public hearing tomorrow, which is approval of an off-premise beer, wine, alcohol license for fresh food mark license, uh, Joanna Marks Miles at 10685 uh, Veteran Memorial Highway, Lithia Springs 30122. And that uh, public hearing will be uh, orchestrated by Ron Roberts. Uh, Ron, do you have a comment regarding this uh, public hearing? Uh, no, ma'am. The, uh, uh, the applicant has gone through the RAS certification. It is a complete packet, Madam Chair. Everything has been done. The uh, measurements have been taken. Um, we are ready to uh, have the public hearing. I think it's actually going to be on Thursday morning, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to move on to our presentation, Ron, since you have the floor. This is a perfect time for you. We have one presentation this morning, Board of Commissioners, this is the Scenic Byway 166 presentation and request for resolution in support of application to GDOT. Board of Commissioners, I ask you to hold your questions to the end of the presentation to allow um, us to move through this process today pretty seamlessly. We'll get Allison, Allison Duncan's on the line. She's got the presentation we're going to pull up and walk, okay. walk through it. We've got eight slides. We're going to go fast because I know you, I know you need to, to get to your regular business. This should not be a surprise to anybody. We've actually met with three of the commissioners already on this. This was a project work element that was identified in the comprehensive land use plan. And last week, um, uh, Miguel kicked off the CTP, the comprehensive transportation plan. And uh, I, was, I was on there as a stakeholder, so we've mentioned it. Um, the designation does a, uh, let's see if we can get the, uh, we've got a couple slides to, to walk through, if we can. Yeah. So seeking a scenic highway designation can provide a, a catalyst for the development of a community vision. They're created not just to promote a scenic route. These designations offer the uh, 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 communities an opportunity to engage in, a, in the planning process and help shape the future. The designation process allows for communities to identify and develop strategies to help manage resources that are important to maintain. Um, it's also, uh, there's also an economic uh, component to this, Madam Chair uh, and, and Commissioners, good morning. Um, there's the, the opportunity with uh, the preserve coming online, Chattahoochee Riverland study, identifying more and more uh, accesses to the river. Uh, just really felt like this was the appropriate time uh, to go ahead and move forward with, uh, with applying for uh, the South Douglas Scenic Byway um, as a uh, scenic byway designation in the state. Uh, this is a good thing because we would also be included on all the state maps and welcome centers and things of that nature. We've got about, uh, when I spoke about the, uh, the different uh, uh, areas along this route, we have some slides we're going to walk through that uh, I think we've already shown with, shared with Commissioner Carthen and with uh, Commissioner Guider. Allison, do you want to walk through those, those some of the historic sites and things like that that we've, we've, we've actually uh, identified 
Uh, sure thing. Uh, do you see the slides advancing now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the map that you um, have before you here shows the proposed route of the de designated byway. Um, we are proposing uh, that the byway start um, at the intersection of Highway 166 and Highway 92 um, and kind of go all the way to the county boundary. So you can see the dark gray um, line is what we're proposing as the byway. Um, based on the criteria of the scenic byway application, we've also identified um, a series of agricultural uh, recreational, historic, and cultural resources along the byway. Uh, and so, uh, to Ron's point, I'll share a little bit of that with you now. I have just about three slides to walk through. Um, and I apologize, there seems to be a delay on my end for the slides advancing. Um, so, here we go. Um, so, looking at the section there between uh, Highway 92 and kind of uh, mm. right across the. Christian me last night, I was like, mm. I'm sorry? Somebody, if, if everyone just mute your microphones. That would be Bobby Holmes. All right. Should be good, Gary Allison. Thank you. Hey. Uh, so jump back in. We'll show you um, in right there where the old Hamilton Ferry is located. Um, you can see we've identified a number of resources that we think would qualify this for, for a scenic byway, including the View Lodge. Uh, close proximity to Sweetwater Creek State Park, particularly through the proposed, proposed trail corridor um, that is running between Bass State Park, Underwaters Park itself, uh, as well as uh, several agricultural resources, um, urban farms that are growing in that kind of move to the next. We're having some technical uh, All right, so as we continue on down the highway, yeah, so again, I apologize. Can you hear me okay? Yes, now we can. Okay, all right. Um, so moving on down the proposed route of the byway, um, again, a number of historic resources and agricultural resources. Uh, one of the ones that I would highlight is that the large uh, park that Southern Conservation Trust is working to develop at the old uh, Bear Creek Golf Course, um, as well as the new park that the county is working on, Pumpkin Town Park. Um, we think these are going to be amazing amenities for the community as they uh, come online and I think would be a real asset um, for a scenic byway designation. And then advancing to the next slide, uh, so uh, as we continue the route of the byway to the county line, um, a number of resources that you're already aware of, the reservoir is a tremendous um, asset. Uh, Basket Creek Cemetery um, is one of the very few National Register listed cemeteries in the state of Georgia. That's a real asset for Douglas County. Again, several other working farms um, and parks and recreational opportunities that we have in that area. Um, so I will turn it back over to Ron to share anything else that he wanted to about the, um, the specific sites that we're proposing as a part of the application process. Thank you, Allison. I, just, I think uh, uh, for, for brevity's sake, uh, like I said, everyone should be kind of familiar with uh, with Scenic Byway. I think my predecessors had had toyed around, two predecessors had toyed around with, with, with submitting it that's not been done. We think it's a, a good idea. We think it's going to help preserve the area. We have identified some historic resources that we would like to include in the application and we would uh, seek support of the resolution to move forward with uh, actually uh, putting in for the Scenic Byway designation um, and, uh, and begin the work. It's a lot of work on staff. Uh, there's no financial obligation to the county at this time, uh, and, and I don't know exactly what that would be, but we'd be meeting with community representatives. We already have some stakeholders from several commissioners um, and moving forward with actually holding those meetings and uh, uh, moving forward. So at this time, I think we're, uh, we're uh, open for questions, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Ron and Allison. Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions or comments for Ron and Allison? Thank you so much, Ron and Allison. This morning we're going to move on to our next item. Madam item. Chair. Okay, Vice Chairman Robinson. It took me a second. Hold on. Here I come. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, I, I do. Um, it, though I, I know this is, um, we're trying to move this agenda along. It, it's during times like this where you, you should uh, do things like this, uh, which is planning and um, forecasting for the future of my planning. and. I can't let this one go. 
you're right, um, Manager Roberts. We've been working on this since I came on board. We've had these conversations with, with a couple of commissioners um, prior to all the ones that are here. Uh, and, 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 and they, they never got the beauty of what that thing represents. And I know a lot of people talk about, well, there's not much in Douglas. And it's like, okay, but it's what we make it. You not get the raw land that's here. You get how beautiful that that, that, that southern corridor is all the way through from the corner of 92 all the way through three and four. And it is how do you harness it? Right? And I appreciate what you guys are doing, which is you're moving us along because people talk about it, but if, uh, unless they value it, they'll do nothing for it. They'll not invest any time and energy into it. I mean that that's our water conservation, that's our future development edition for it. Like, okay guys, and I'm I'm happy to hear the administration finally has passed talent in place to, you know, to, to get this, to take the character areas and be able to, to, to bring together something that, you know, they hear the hearts of leadership, but you've got to be able to translate that into a plan. And, and I, I really appreciate that. So that being said, so now from 92, that was my opening, from 92 out all the way to, all the way out to Carol, all the way out. How many miles is that? 25 miles, 30 miles, a marathon, two. Can you show me the distance, please? I don't know. I know the distance right off the top of my head. I don't. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alex. Um, address to? that that question. Um, we've included this information in a in a copy of the data sheet and the statement of significance. Um, so it's 3.6 miles between Highway 92 and 166, and 15.4 miles. Um, excuse me. Uh, for the the rest of the length to the county boundary. All right. So let's say about a little less than a marathon. Right. All the way out. Did, did I hear that right? All the way out. All right, so, and at one point, and I know this is part of the, the broader comprehensive transportation plan. At one point, we, we looked at um, investing into this and, and, and creating bike trails and blue trails and all of these these types of things. And I, I get that um, the, the agriculture um, um, and obviously the farms that come along there and, and maybe there is a, a commercial aspect to it. But it, um, I'm here, I'm glad to hear this is probably more of a deliberate activity. I appreciate the commercial people coming here and investing in us, but that's on their terms. This begins to create an atmosphere in which, okay, we get to pick what we're looking for. Almost like with our economic development, we pick the corridors, we pick those sectors that we went after, high tech, etc. So again, I, I just got to emphasize, like, okay, it's time to go to another level. And and I appreciate the, the thought leadership around this one right here. Like, okay, guys, don't don't drop that district core. You guys got this district three. Okay, guys, y'all understand this. Now begin to formulate what this needs to be for the future. And there's one in time in which you do this. And weigh in. Don't let the, don't let people who want to invest in us dictate our terms. Now we appreciate they're picking their land, but you, you can at least establish all right, this is designated as this. This is versus getting into a negotiation. Well, you you sort of late to the party. And so I, I again I'm encouraged, uh, Madam Chair, by your staff and um, pushing this and bringing this before us um, to give consideration. I'm sure my others may, may or may not have any opinion, but this one is something that's always been in my heart. I, uh, I know the importance. I mean, it's our future. I mean, District 1, we get it. We know how important they are to the county. I mean, obviously, that's the county seat. It, it's important. It all roads lead through District 1, and I, I get the economic engine of District 2, and I, I get District 3, our water, our conservation. I get District 4, all raw land. I, I get it. Now pull it all together and make it work. So that's all I got to say, Madam Chair. I yield the floor. Thank you. I'm good for now. Okay, thank you so much. We're going to move on if there are no other comments. All right. Uh, tab number seven, County Administrative Business, authorization to approve the GDOT mowing and maintenance agreement for the I-20 landscaping and the gateway signage and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. County Administrator Mark Teal. Um, yes, ma'am. This is your typical uh, Georgia TOT maintenance and mowing agreement. Um, as a result of the I-20 landscaping project and the gateway signage. Um, so before we can get started, we have this maintenance agreement that needs to be uh, approved and we have a, uh, we have a bond that we're working on. We're trying to get that one, uh, um, removed and if not, we'll bring that back to the board. Okay. Any questions for the board or from the board or comments? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Vice Chairman Roberts. Yeah, ma'am. All right, so I, I, I trust this is part of, um, part of the priorities of the county as far as beautification. 
I, I trust that this is part of the, you know, sort of that bigger party just sort of keep things clean. Um, it's what citizens have been asking for, is, which is our reasonable service. Can you, can, you, can you clean this up? I get the corridors. I, I get the exits. Uh, but again, one more time, um, and I, I'm, I'm sure some of you have uh, recognized, and I'm sure had her, uh, heard stated that the county recently, and, and it's something that I, I know as party is important, right? So I, I appreciate what I'm hearing, that there's a, a deliberate commitment by the administration to fulfill what she's been saying for four years. And it's about being consistent, right? And and, and so I and I, I hear that we got a couple problems with I don't know what you said. We got to remove the bonds. It may have to come before us. And I'm like, okay, how hard is it to cut grass? How difficult is this? And and, and it, it's always well, we got to work through this. And it's like I can't come on, guys. We can build a jail in 18 months. Uh, we can't cut no grass. And, and so I, again. I, I think we, we just get started on, on the narrative, but I, I appreciate, um, again, I'm sure the floor for a moment. I, I stay within my three minutes. I yield the floor. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to tab number eight. Tab number eight is under grants. We had three, three grants this morning for commissioners that we are just bringing before you. Tab number eight is authorization to accept the family Connections grant award in the amount of $43,000 for the period July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021 for the Douglas Corps to authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and to amend the budget. Director Jennifer King. Mm -hmm. There you are. Yes, ma'am. This is um, the grant that we get every year for Douglas Corps. Um, and as stated, it's in the amount of $43,000 for them to operate pretty straightforward okay any questions from the board yes okay Vice Chair I Robinson. and i promise only had one cup of coffee all right so madam chair this is the question this is more for the broader board which is as we talk about grants and um it's uh, it's about evaluating performance and outcome and so and, and again i'm using core only because it, and i'm not going to apply this to each of the other ones but Core is something obviously we've taken a look at over the past couple of years, and we've asked for like midterm reports and, and different things like that. And, it, and I, I still think that there's a there's a time to raise the standard of evaluation. In other words, like well, why are we keep pursuing these grants, or should we change these grants? Why do we keep looking at these contracts versus changing them? And we as commissioners would like to have, at least I would like to have, I mean, a more consistent. Not saying that people are not provided. I'm saying a consistent evaluation of well, are we getting what we're I mean, I don't know. We keep they keep giving us the money, but it's like, okay, I get it. We apply for it, and we get it, but there's no measurement. So I, I sometimes I wonder, are we are we being effective? Now I know this one has to do more with operations, but I'm speaking to the broader one, so I don't have to come back to it, uh, to this statement, which is, it, it's just well, where's the measurement? Where's the outcome? Where? And again, maybe they're tucked away uh, within each of these agencies and, and what they do. We just don't have enough visibility. All I see is that we're rubber stamping grant applications or receive, uh, applying for grants, receiving grants, and there's no real like, okay, okay. And, and so it's just those moments. It's how you bring forth your narrative in this exchange, right? Because in the absence, I'm sure the public can have like, well, yeah, he's right. Where's the, it, it's the mechanics of what we're doing. And it's how we're viewed. It's like, okay, are we just rubber stamping? Is there real measurement check? I mean, I'm held to a, a standard. I get it. And so likewise, everything associated with that measurement should be consistent. So anyway, I'm going to let that go because um, I think that as we get into, uh, obviously, the budget retreat process, um, as we get into um, our, our, uh, the whole budget adoption, the, the, the going into next year, I, I think I'm, at least I'm going to be advancing something that says, I, there needs to be a higher standard and there needs to be consistency uh, and I, I just think that we're uh, and this is not about you Jennifer King this is more of our own um, board commissioners like okay guys is this is this good enough uh, as, as a measurement I mean are, are, are the citizens getting what they're supposed to be getting out of this or, or do we sort of veil it behind and just just Ooh, don't say that just don't say that so anyway you guys get it um, I just want something to, to consider as we go into this, this 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 tail end of the next two months. It's like okay, like let, let's take this to a whole nother level. 
All right, that was three minutes and 20 seconds, Madam Chair. I yield. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jennifer, can you respond, uh, Director King, to um, some of the concerns that Vice Chairman Robinson has? I know that you do keep some uh, metrics and some information and some statistics and data. We just haven't probably, well, I know we haven't had a, uh, the opportunity to deliver, and that would be something that I'll be looking going forward, maybe once a year or twice a year, a comprehensive report, just to give the uh, Board of Commissioners an idea of what's going on in those particular areas before, again, uh, quote, unquote, before they rubber stamp anything. So can you share yes, what you have, please? Yes. Um, you know, with, with the grants, we are constantly having to provide reports back to that grant source. Um, you know, some are quarterly, some are yearly. Uh, there's constant information being shared back to them. So that's very easy for us to accomplish and pass on. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Um, it's good for us, too, to show what work we are doing with this money. So definitely something we need to do. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. And count, County Administrator, I know you'll drive it. I just threw it out there. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to tab number nine, authorization to accept the felony drug court grant award in the amount of $40,809 from the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council to provide funding for a part-time case manager and amend the budget and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Tim Pruitt. Good morning, Madam Chair. Tim, good morning, Board. Good Tuesday. morning. <clears throat> This is a new grant for us. This is a pass-through grant from CJCC. We've never had this before. This is in response to our growing population in the accountability courts. We have uh, 82 active participants in our drug court right now, and this part-time case manager position will supplement the full-time case manager, pos manager position we already have. That case manager position is supervising more people than they recommend and this will satisfy that need. Okay. Any questions from the board? All right. Pretty self uh, Here. Well, uh Commissioner Carpenter, I think I heard you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Pruitt. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Good. Is there a match that is needed from the county for this particular grant? Yes and no. There is a match, but it's actually already accounted for in my salary, so there are no additional budget dollars needed from the county for this money. Okay, so when the, when this is amended, it will come strictly from you all's budget? That is correct. And did you say this was a part-time or a full-time position? Part-time. It's a part-time position. Okay. And... Uh, how many caseworkers do y'all have in the Drug Accountability Court? So Drug Court, I have one senior case manager. In our Hope Court program, I have a second case manager. So this will be our third case manager position, which will be a part-time position. Which will be a part-time position. Okay. And so what is, you, you said there are 82 participants now. What What is usually the amount? You said we've grown from what to what? We have actually, during COVID, we have grown uh, exponentially. We were at 52 participants uh, at the beginning of March. And so we have continued largely through the investments we've made in technology. Uh, we actually never missed a day of court and we never missed an hour of treatment. And we were able to continue to bring people out of jail into treatment during COVID which okay. is something that is unique in the country. Uh, we actually provided a nationwide uh, webinar on how to continue operations during COVID uh, not too long ago with Thermo Fisher Scientific, which was a, a, a great experience. Uh -huh. uh, so we have grown from 52 to 82 uh, since March. Got you. Thank you so much for the work that you all are doing and thank you for uh, actually applying for this grant and receiving it. I hope it'll be an ongoing grant. Thank you, Chairman Jones. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Carpton. Okay, if there's no other comment, we're gonna move on to your next item, um, Director Pruitt. Tab number 10, authorization for the Felony Drug Court to accept a grant award for the Office of Justice Programs in the amount of $499,997 to be utilized to create a specialized opioid track within the current drug court program, amend the budget and authorize the Chairman to sign all related documents. Director Pruitt. 
I'm actually going to yield the floor to Judge McLean, who is with us right now, and I hope oh, that you okay. all can see. Thank you, Judge. The presentation you have up. Good morning. Good morning, Madam, Judge. Members of the board, um, I wanted to take a minute to kind of, I guess, introduce this exciting new program that we're going to bring to Douglas County with your help to focus on the other pandemic. Um, we all know about the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we're all affected by it. Um, somebody asked me the other day, uh, what's it like? And I said, well, I'm having to change everything about the way I do everything. That's what it's like. And I suspect that it's that way for the rest of you. But in the meantime, there's another pandemic that's been going on. Um, we have lost, I think, over 200,000 people to the coronavirus. And some folks have commented that the United States uh, has 5% of the world's population and 20% of the world's COVID deaths. Well, if you show the next slide, Mr. Pruitt, um, the CDC not only uh, helps manage our response to coronavirus, they also help manage our response to the other pandemic, the opioid pandemic. You can shut, there you go. You see there, you see that slide right there, that's from the CDC website. You can see CDC on the upper left-hand corner. And while the coronavirus pandemic has captured our attention, this other pandemic continues to uh, rise. We're gonna have more people die from opioid overdose than from coronavirus. In the last several years in America, we've had over 400,000 people die from drug overdoses. Most of those were attributed to the use of opioids, such as heroin, fentanyl, and pharmaceutical opioids. Uh, here's another interesting statistic that I came across. Um, as I said, America has 5% of the world's population it will shock you to learn that America consumes 80 to 90 percent of the world opioid supply. 80 to 90 percent of all the opioids manufactured illicitly or on purpose worldwide are consumed in the United States. So we have a pandemic going on. And if Mr. Pruitt will show the next slide, that pandemic is particularly affecting Douglas County, Georgia. Uh, we do a lot of things well in this community, thanks to your leadership and the leadership of others. But one thing we're not doing as well as we should is our response to the opioid crisis. You can see by looking at that slide from, that we have from time to time um, been one of the highest counties in the state for opioid overdoses. We've hit the top five more than once. Mr. Pruitt gets data from, I think it's HIDA, High Intensity Drug Task Force. It's operated by the federal government. And so we get reports every month on what's going on with uh, drug use and drug overdoses. And Douglas County keeps hitting one of the five highest county rates of drug overdose. So what we want to do with your help and your blessing is to attack that problem vigorously in Douglas County by bringing the first intensive opioid treatment program to our community with this grant from the United States Department of Justice. I wanna commend Mr. Pruitt. I wanna commend Teresa Gordy, his assistant, and I particularly want to commend you guys because you decided to let us hire an assistant for Mr. Pruitt, which you could have said no to. Well, she did the lion's amount of the work on this competitive grant that I think only DeKalb County is getting the same grant we're getting, half a million dollars to fight opioid uh, overdose and opioid addiction in Douglas County. Uh, Mr. Pruitt can give you the details, uh, but I just want to tell you that uh, in my mind, 
Um, every life is worth saving. Every life has value. And when you see people that are captured by addiction transform into law-abiding, tax-paying citizens, you, you get hungry to do it more and more. And we need to step up our response in Douglas County, and with this grant, we'll be able to. And it's not going to cost uh, the taxpayers of this county any money. There's no budget impact. We can match it with existing funds that are already budgeted. And the bottom line for me is that if we didn't get it, it's appropriated by Congress. It's going to be spent. So let's get it for the citizens of Douglas County. Um, that's just what I wanted to say. I wanted to share my heart briefly, and I want to thank you for your time. And Board of Commissioners, I'll take over for just a second and finish out our presentation here. What you're looking at is actually a map of the state of Georgia, and it is showing in August of 2020, the five counties in the state of Georgia with the most overdose emergency room visits per capita. Now, that doesn't mean that we had more people going to the emergency room than any of the other counties. It means that per 100,000 people in a population, our rate is higher than anyone others. So yes, absolutely, Fulton County will have more total emergency room visits. But what is important about this graph is that Douglas County, for every pair of shoes walking the streets, has a higher chance of overdose than Fulton, DeKalb, Cobb, Gwinnett, Rockdale, Clayton, anyone except Bartow County, as it turns out. They were number one in August of 2020, and that was the most recent data that we have. And Judge was absolutely correct. We work on this through the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And so the next slide that I'm showing is the actual rate, which for Douglas County is 34.5. That placed us at number two. It is important to realize that, again, this is for every person in the county, our rate of overdose surpassed 158 other counties. It's only Bartow that managed to beat us out in August. So opioids are hitting this county and they are hitting us hard. The feds have realized this. Public health has realized this. We realize this locally through the work that we do through the normal drug court. Our methamphetamine addiction has always been the highest drug of choice for our participants. It is the number one treatment that we offer is for methamphetamine addiction. That is slowly being eaten alive by the opioid epidemic in Douglas County. It is on the rise and we're trying to do something about that. How are we doing that? Our first step is a very significant BJA award. It is $499,997 to Douglas County for us to implement the court the judge mentioned. Our notice came out from October 16th, so this is two weeks ago, uh, where the Department of Justice talks about all of its grants and we are listed in that public notification. But our second step is to start engaging our stakeholders and the Board of Commissioners, you are our primary stakeholders because without your blessing and authorization, we can't begin this work and we will watch more people die. And I know that your heart is for us to continue to do the work that we've done. And my heart is to give you the best results that we can for Douglas County. There is not another opioid court in the state. We will be the first and that is important. We're gonna do that through some new innovations that haven't been done anywhere. Some of those are new cognitive behavioral treatments that we're not currently offering. So a new treatment modality, integrating medically assisted treatment of naltrexone and Vivitrol into the opioid court from day one. We have very good technology and support where we'll actually be able to conduct primary care assessments in the jail for telemedicine, be able, with, through a private contract, be able to get that person a naltrexone prescription and have a smart 
medical dispensary that we can give to a participant that runs off a fingerprint that allows them to dispense their medication to keep them alive on a routine basis that report to us and lets us know how they're doing. We'll also be enhancing our case planning in a new way. We'll be adding additional supports. Um, this grant actually allows for a, a full-time physician that's in addition to the positions we've already talked about today. We will likely be asking that grant to split that position up into part-time positions because we're going to be doing some very late night work in this. It is not commonly from 8 to 5 that we find our most work done in the opioid crisis. A lot of times it's 10 o'clock to midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, and we're going to be strategically placing available staff where they need to be so that we can intervene in those crises. And one of the most important features of the opioid crisis, and he didn't even mention this, but Judge McLean will actually be meeting with these participants virtually every day from the bench on a judicial check-in. And that is a national model that came out about three years ago from the state of New York. We'll be taking that model and changing it and improving it, I believe, in a unique way. But I'm excited that we get a chance she can't get out where she to she did impact earlier. Douglas County and our citizens in a positive way because we see this problem coming. It is a rising tide that we're trying to deal with and we need your help. And I believe that that is the end of that presentation. So I'm available for questions. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Director Pruitt. Any questions for Director Pruitt or Judge McLean? I do have a one a, a comment to say that congratulations. This is definitely exciting to hear that uh, Douglas County would be the first opioid program in the state of Georgia. That's huge. That's large. And it's largely because of all the hard work you, Judge McLean, and Tim Pruitt have done to make this possible. So I'm most just definitely grateful. And I'm quite sure the board uh, commissioners as well. This is something we've been talking about quite a while. This opioid crisis in the United States, and I agree with you, Judge. It's not going away. It's just getting worse. So it's time for us to tackle it head on. So congratulations. Uh, I think you want to say something, Vice Chair. I see your head moving. Are you? Did you want to say something? Okay. Yeah. Vice yes, Chairman yes. Hobson. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. Opiate is something that's, that that is important. I mean, you know, when I came out of high school in 1984, from 85 to 2015, that 30-year policy, uh, we know there was a lot of incarcerations and things dealing with uh, marijuana. Um, and that policy ran its course, and now we're in a different era where opiates is now popping. We sort of almost normalized marijuana, though it still has a federal implications. It, 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 it sort of, we've normalized it, right? Almost like alcohol, we're waiting for it to go legal. Now this opiate has a different animal. This is a beast. And it's, it's impacting parts of our community. Um, and you guys know I get it. And, okay, so this, this crisis is hitting and it, in, in light of the pandemic and it, it, it's coping mechanism, right? It, 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 and then it lets me know that, okay, look at Douglas County, like, look, look at the tell of two worlds, like, okay, so, it's on the edge of, of sort of the metro, but yet why is there, why is there such drug use? Now, don't get me wrong, ladies and gentlemen, that's the judicial side. They're interventions. They are a person already caught the case. And so through, through the judge's uh, spirit and his heart, I, I get it. All right, we're, we're on the legislative side. Our job is just to create the atmosphere to try to prevent this. These are two different worlds. We hope they would never, never get there to be before our uh, Superior Court judges, for that matter. So I do get it, right? And I, and I appreciate that. Uh, what I know, um, Judge McLean, since 2015, when we began this conversation regarding mental and drug and DUI and all of those courts, the alternative sentencing options is that, like, no, he's that guy. But but I, I look at this like, okay, but who is it? Who's going to benefit from this? And how do we stay this off? And we as Board of Commissioners, what else can we do uh, to to prevent this? To, to ensure that there's equality and, and equitable distribution of, of opportunities in the pursuit of happiness, and, uh, as opposed to just, it, it, it just seems like, ah, uh, why is that this kind of, to your point, per capita? I mean, uh, Tim Pruitt, thank you, Director, because I'm like, ooh, really? Top five per capita. Look at that. 
top five in voting for the past three presidential cycles and top five in opiate use. How about that? Hmm. And, I, I, and I'm, I'm like, okay, but what's really going on, Douglas? It appears to be a tell of two worlds. There's some concerns. So as I, as I sit here, and again, I commend you guys that you're seeking that money and you're leveraging them dollars. And, and you've always been that way. You guys are very uh, diligent and efficient what you do. So I, I appreciate that. But it, it be, again, it, it, Judge McClain and I know we're over here. They're over there. So I, I, I'm, as I reconcile the, the approval and the casting of my vote for this, I'm also like, okay, but what does this mean for me in the greater, the, you know, the, the greater good? It, it, what, what does this mean for, okay, now how do I prevent this? How do I now leverage what he's got, his half million dollars? How do I now come and, and save all people from being able to do that? Yeah, we have those forms. We, we're doing things, but how do I prevent it versus intervention? And so, um, Again, I, I, I mean, job well done, but there's, it, it, it's just, again, one more time, are we awake to what, what y'all just said? Does the public know what you just said? I'm just trying to drop on that point. Like, I, again, my hat's off to the work you guys doing and your staff and your part-time staff and y'all are leveraging and you have a yield on our uh, investment of tax dollars. I, I, I get all that, but it speaks to the bigger picture. Like, oh, well, we are hurting. I mean, those some serious drugs to your point. Those drugs are serious. So. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and yield the floor. I just had to share my heart as well. Continue on, gentlemen, in court, uh, um, Judge McClain, and, and tell you guys doing a great job. But it makes me think on my side, okay, as we go into a new year, a new era, how do we now help stave off this versus just treating it after the fact? How do, how do we now redistribute at a local level? I yield the floor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Robinson. Uh, Commissioner Carson? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Pruitt and Judge Bill McClain, thank you for doing this. This is obviously well needed. Uh, one of my questions to you is that I heard uh, Mr. Pruitt, you stating that you would award a contract to be able to provide the um, the um, naltrexone and um, naltrexone and the Vavitrol was the other drug that you were speaking. Of. Can I get everyone to mute the mic, mic, please? Okay. Because you're, you're getting a little feedback. I'm just trying to help you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, that's much better. A little bit. Okay. So uh, one of one of the things that I want to um, to put out is the use of CSB. Um, Mr. Ray Lightford over at CSB told me that they will have um, a in pharmacy clinic. Um, starting on January 1st. Uh, he would love to be a part of this because he already has staff. That way you don't have to necessarily use the funds to provide your own staff. So we can continue the ecosystem. If we can keep this money within Douglas County and make sure that these contracts um, are utilized for our CSB and um, other um, pharmacies within the county, then of course it's a win-win for all of Douglas County. We wish none of our citizens would have to uh, resort to um, abusing um, opioids, uh, but it is a slippery slope. And there have been many that uh, we know who are high profile who have gotten caught up in opioid addiction. Um, so um, no shame in the game. You just wanna make sure that as we provide the treatment, as they come in contact with you all, that we're keeping most of everything that we do here in Douglas County. Um, also, would this uh, mean that the Board of Commissioners will have to get out of our suite because you're going to need another court and, and more room? What, what, what does this mean, Judge Bill McClain? <laughs> it, it means I'll just have to work harder. You have to work harder. I, I know, I know uh, we, we talked about it uh, a few weeks ago that there uh, there may have to be night court and other things. I mean, y'all are just innovating, and, and kudos to you. Uh, it, it speaks of how you are progressing and moving Douglas County forward and making sure that you're serving the citizens of the county. But to my board of commissioners, we got to see what's going on. We got to start making some moves to progress so that our judges and the court system has what they need in order to keep it moving forward. So again, thank you, Judge Bill McLean, and thank you, Mr. Pruitt, for all you're doing. Madam Chair, I yield. You're muted. You're, you're muted. muted. <laughs> oh, 
Thank you. I talked about two minutes without knowing. Thank you all so much. Uh, we're going to move to our business item. Uh, tap number Madam Chair, real, real quick. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. To, 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 to thank you real quick. So to, to Madam Carthen's point and, and Judge McClain, we had this conversation um, a, a, a few years ago when we started the mental health work. And and, and it, was, it was the challenge is, okay, but at some point you're going to have to sustain this. At some point you're going to need housing. Uh, at some point you're going to need it and we had this similar conversation where we're going we're going to innovate it not get it but okay if one can put in two can and I'm, I'm looking at this like okay but as i go into a budget cycle as we go into strategic planning as we go into this like okay judge you know how we get we're trying to anticipate your need ma'am Carson was like okay we got a, a, a probate judge that now needs some court and staff we now have you guys like no we, we, you don't don't overestimate revenue and underestimate the cost. That's inverted. And so we're just planting the seed. You guys are good, but I'm just to that point. I need my director uh, of, of all the directors who may be associated with finance and so forth. Yeah, I need to pay attention to this. We have to anticipate. Now, again, they do their job. They their their service delivery. They, they, we get it, but we should come alongside of them and hear their hearts. And okay, guys, let's create a model that at least at least that we can now begin to. Uh, anticipate the future and the impact on, on this growth. It says, okay, but you're going to still need something. You know, we're going to still continue to need. All right, so how do we how do we sustain this? And, and yes, you are going to continue to innovate, but there's still a cost. And while I know you're going to leverage grants and all that, but yeah, there's still a cost. There's still this part time or that person or that person. At some point, there's a scale that only so much you can carry in a single day. And while I appreciate the humbleness and the humility, and it is not a, 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 a fake humility. We're like, no, we got you, and we hear you. And so we'll have to do the heavy lifting to get our minds around that number that says, okay, y'all trying to sustain this and make this and, 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 and institutionalize this innovation, then we lay that down as part of our planning process and get ahead of it. Not obligate ourselves to it yet, but it's just we anticipate. So I just want to make that market, y'all know it. By, by doing this, this is setting us down a path. So I yield, Madam Chair. All right, okay. thank you. Thank you so much, okay. uh, Commissioner Carthen and Commissioner Robinson. Okay. Uh, Chairman Jones. Oh, you, okay, your hand is up again. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Commissioner Carson. Yes. One, one question that I totally forgot to ask. Does this revolve, um, does this involve a match from the county? Uh, no, ma'am. We're going to, we can use existing grant funds as the match. So there's not an actual additional expenditure by the Board of Commissioners. But I want to quickly just plant a seed and comment on uh, the vice chair's comments um, one thing we're looking at very closely vice chair is sanctuary village is going to have a part to play in this because one of the biggest problems we have with people coming hot out of the jail who are heroin addicts is keep them alive long enough for treatment to take effect and unfortunately, the existing supervised housing that we have in the county through uh, Dr. Ford, the capacity is, is exceeded. So we have a lot of people sitting in jail because there's no housing. And uh, sometimes people don't get into drug court because there's simply no housing option for them. A lot of them choose to wait. Uh, some of them decide to just go ahead and resolve their case. So what we're looking at is a mixture of straight up homeless people at Sanctuary Village and some opiate people because then we can take someone straight out of jail into a housing option that has a level of supervision. We're looking at having the office of this case manager at Sanctuary Village. We're looking at having additional support for the village. We're going to leverage this opiate money to provide additional support for the other residents of Sanctuary Village because we don't have any office space for the people we're talking about. It, it just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So those are some things we're looking at and of course that's a different conversation but once I get to the point of launching Sanctuary Village I'm going to obviously have a detailed conversation with you guys about what it's going to look like and how it's going to be staffed that sort of thing. But that's part of what I looked at here, and I think that directly addresses uh, the vice chair's comment that I wanted to address. Thanks, okay. sir. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chairman Robinson. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Carson, and thank you, Judge Tiny, Tim Pruitt, Director. I have a, number 11 is for you as well. It's a, the first business item of the day. It is authorization to approve a memorandum of understanding between the other uh, circuit accountability courts and Anthony J. Nicolosa and uh, authorize the chairman to uh, sign all related documents. Director Pruitt. So for my final item, this is uh, housekeeping. Mr. Nicolosi, very good. You were very close. I was Madam close. Chair. You're close. You're close. He's a, yes. Uh, he is a vital member of our working staff. He is a contractor, uh, but has been with us for a number of years, started out part-time and now takes on a majority of hours with us. Um, he has had a lot of training. This is a continuation of a previous MOU. I have to bring this back before the board uh, every year or so, so that we can update it. Uh, there's no increase in pay. There's no increase in hours. It is simply a refreshing of the current understanding that we have with Mr. Nicolosi so he can keep providing us service. Okay. Any questions from, from the board? Okay. Thank you so much, Director Pruitt. Thank you. We're, we're going to move on to tab number 12, Board of Commissioners, is authorization to approve agreement amendment by Civic Plus to convert billing for their online registration software and service from a monthly percentage-based billing cycle to an annualized flat fee in the amount of $5,093 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Dukes, Gary Dukes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yes, ma'am. This is the uh, annual con contract with a company that provides our software for our online registration of all of our classes that we provide throughout the county and also the reservations that uh, our citizens can do online for our parks, uh, amenities, such as ball fields, uh, picnic areas, and so forth. And it has been uh, reviewed by legal. Okay. Any questions for Director Dukes? Board? Pretty self-explanatory. Thank you so much, Director Dukes. We're going to move on to tab number 13, authorization to approve part-time contracts with Jesse Clemens, Brian Byers, Rufus Huntley, and Dean Ricketts as deputy coroners and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, Coroner Godwin, are you on the line? Coroner Godwin, I know I spoke with you earlier this morning. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to move on. Lisa, do you by any chance Chair, see this form? Yes. Yes, ma'am. She called in, so I don't, I'm not sure if you're still on, Renee, but you may need to unmute your phone if you are. Let me check and see if she's still on. What I'll do, Lisa, just, I'm going to move on to the next one and then we'll, while you're trying to get prepared for her. For the okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Order Commissioners, we're just going to put a pin in number 13 and we'll just pivot back. 14, authorization to approve Dominion Voting Systems Form of Services Order for 50 poll pads in the amount of $63,600 grant funded and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Kidd. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dominion Voting Solutions Form of Services state vendors that currently has the state election system. This uh, item agenda is to expand uh, the number of poll paths, which are the voting units that we look up voters at polling locations with to uh, essentially purchase 50 more utilizing funds uh, from the Center for, Center, Center for Tech and Civic Life grant that uh, the county received. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay. We're going to move on to your next item, which is authorization to purchase a mobile bus, voting bus in the amount of $361,816. And this is grant funded as well. Am I correct? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, let me see. Can I take over the screen? Sure. Okay, I was trying to get a little brief. Well, you all, uh, have uh, trying to do a short uh, PowerPoint, but I don't devices. Okay, uh, 
Why TJ is on the line. How, how do I share my screen? Okay, when you <clears throat> when you hover over, um, you should see a camera icon, a microphone icon, and then the next icon is like a rectangle with a with an arrow. If you press it, then you'll have the option of clicking okay. on one of your screens to share. Oh, okay. You see it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, it took my anyway. I don't know if you all can see my screen now. We can. Okay. This is uh, essentially uh, the same bus style. This is the same company that Fulton County worked with uh, in order to do this. Um, this is the exterior of the Fulton County mobile voting unit. This is essentially the inside of the mobile voting unit without uh, the computer equipment inside of it. Some of what we feel are the features of, of the of voting unit. This is one second, a breakdown of the cost of the voting unit. Now, all of these funds are part of the previously stated grant approval that the county has already procured, so there is no budgetary impact to the county at this time. The reason why we had to bring it before the full commission is this is essentially purchasing a vehicle that down the line may have maintenance costs like tires, or changes or things like that that can be discussed as part of future budgetary items, but the initial cost and purchase of the unit is fully covered. Okay, thank you, Director. Okay, let's see how I get back. <laughs> okay. Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions at this point regarding the Oh, okay, I see you. I, I hear you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mitchell. So, Mr. Kidd, just a couple of questions. So, you did mention, I guess, the maintenance side of this. Have you started at least preparing for that? I mean, are you right there? meaning what you put together, not... Yes. Okay, because I think you got to determine what that is versus 
them telling you saying, you know. No, no, no. It would be putting uh, putting together a plan of this is what this would cost if you choose to utilize these features. Correct. They're not required to utilize those features. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Now, the other question, though. So with the equipment that will go inside, will that be some special type of equipment? Will you be able to go in there with boats, or will you be able to able just go in there and just sit around and just... And no, you, okay. this essentially is a drivable polling location. Okay. Uh, fr from my perspective, this expands the capacity for advanced voting. This, uh, right now, we've had conversations with several precincts due to the coronavirus that had some uh, issue with us coming inside of that precinct. This will allow us to have the leverage that if we did have to take out a precinct, we could still maintain the continuity of an elections process. Got it. This, this, well, will this be like you'll pull up in somebody's neighborhood and say, okay, so I'll leave on a vote coming out of Hunter's Ridge. Come right down. Yes, we, we, we plan, yes, sir, we plan on scheduling days and times that essentially the mobile voting unit will be at different uh, sections throughout the county on specific days. Got it. How many will it, it house at any given time? Is it no more than four, 10, 50? What, 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 what would it house? The setup of the inside of the unit is county uh, specific, so I'm thinking probably around 10 to 15 units. So 10 to 15 units of people inside, it could, it could, it will be able to, but I'm assuming uh, based on, go ahead. Essentially, you would need about three poll workers inside the unit, and you could bring people inside. The 10 to 15 are actual stations for which people would vote on. You, can't see the inside of this one because it's not laid out, but uh, if you think of a traditional voting uh, room, the machinery that you walk up to and vote, this will take uh, those um, that machinery. But during this pandemic, you probably will have to have that based on the social distancing. Yes, and yes, all that we would stuff. control the number of individuals that are allowed inside of the voting unit. Yes. Even though we're not doing it now, we're talking about a year from now that we, you know, I don't know where we'll be at that time when we be still at this. Point. little bit more details at least on my behalf that I'm looking for to make sure I, I truly get I mean I'm, I'm glad that we're actually spending the funds to get this I think uh, and, and will I lay up we wrap our bus band whatever this is considered called Douglas County or we're we gonna wrap it what I just saw that you just that know? was essentially the bus had Fulton County uh, on there because that was the last uh, one that they did ours would say Douglas County mobile voting unit okay so the graphic dealing with Douglas County and our layout. Yes. Okay. All right, uh, I'll yield at that point, but outside of that, good work. Thank you. I'll yield back. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Carthen, I see your hand. Thank you, Chairman Jones. Uh, Director Kidd, good, uh, good morning. My question for you is, have you looked at the um, cost for uh, insurance on this type of a unit. Have you had a chance to speak with our um, uh, safety uh, director, Matt Laverne? Uh, we, I've had uh, some contacts. I still have to get the numbers all together for insurance. Okay. Uh, we definitely need that. I can that. have that for you by tomorrow. Okay, thank you. That was gonna be my next question. My second question for you is, where will, the, where will this be housed? Once you get it and, and it's functioning, where will you house it within the county? Now, within the county, the county, we would have to uh, come up with a, a space to where we're storing the unit, but essentially it would uh, essentially be stored like we do other large scale, uh, th other large scale uh, things like fire trucks and things like that. So if you all agree to this, then I would get uh, with probably uh, fleet services to see where we uh, have the space and capacity to store. It's, it's a basically a RV. An RV, okay. Because I would assume that with it being a mobile voting unit, there may be some sensitive things on there that we would definitely want to keep under lock and key and secure. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Would this unit also, Director Kidd, be used for um, registration, voter registration? 
we have the capacity to use it as far as voter registration, pull it up to affairs and community outreach as far as that aspect as well. I do intend to utilize it for those purposes as well. Okay. And would you also be using this RV for training, uh, like for uh, poll um, workers or, or that type of uh, – I'm just trying to see how many uses could you get out of this. I think it's a great we, idea, but I just don't we want can, to get that. Yeah, we can utilize it for training as well because it will have a full complement of elections uh, equipment. All right, um, good deal. And these funds, I believe you told us, have to be used by the end of the year, and this helps you to do that in compliance with the grant funds that you've been given? Yes, ma'am. This uh, essentially, there are certain uh, items on uh, the grant funding was one to look at expanding your opportunity to vote to different members of, of your community. This will essentially allow us to expand uh, election day and uh, an advanced voting site as well okay and will and will this unit also be ada compliant Since yes it will be ada compliant okay all right thank you so much director kid i yield the floor madam chair all right thank you Commissioner carson uh attorney bernard i believe you want to weigh in and you had some you could respond to the insurance related question uh attorney bernard yes ma'am can you hear me okay we can okay so this vehicle will be uh, will be titled in the county and so therefore and it'll be assigned to the board of elections no different than any other motor vehicle in the pool it'll be assigned to the boat, uh, board of elections and registration so it will go on the county's insurance. So it's not a matter of privately pricing the insurance on this. It's a matter of Matt in, uh, adding it to the inventory. The only other thing I would suggest that Milton do get with Matt on is depending upon size of the vehicle, it may require a CDL in order to operate uh, this compliant with our safety protocols for purposes of our discount. And lastly, uh, I think Commissioner Carthen mentioned security. Uh, Milton, if the contents inside this motor vehicle uh, are expensive, like computers or whatnot, Matt needs to know that to make sure that when it's assigned on our insurance, the, co the cost of the contents is covered in the policy. But I, I don't think it's a, it's a matter of going out and buying separate insurance. It's just a matter of adding it to our fleet. I do think that Commissioner Carkin's point about securing it is a big deal. And there's got to be set aside in the motor vehicle pool for this to be secured somewhere, I would recommend. So anyway, I hope that answers or follows up on Milton's responses. Thank you so much, uh, Attorney Bernard. All right, if there are no other questions regarding this, you have one more, and then I understand that the coroner has joined us. But I just want to finish ta uh, tab number 16 with you, Director Kidd, and then we'll be, uh, com your items will be complete for, for now. Uh, tab number 16, which is authorization to purchase a ballot extractor with signature verification software in the amount of $31,553. Can you explain this to the board? Okay. Are you able to see my screen at this time? Yeah, we see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. This is essentially the ballot extractor. The ballot extractor is a device that, uh, cuts open absentee ballots that remove the content of the absentee ballots. Right now, uh, what we're doing, we're individually having, when well, we hire poll workers that are individually cutting uh, absentee ballots and removing the content to be able to scan absentee ballots. So this is basically mechanizing that process. The ballot uh, extractor uh, funds, this is another uh, grant funded item in its entirety uh, for, for uh, from the same uh, grant that we uh, brought before this board before. This is the total cost that's on the screen of uh, the ballot extractor. The ballot extractor does have basically some additional features that can be uh, purchased. The total cost of uh, the ballot extractor would be covered this year if the county so chooses to enter into a maintenance uh, agreement for future years with uh, the company, this is essentially a company that's used by other counties as well, 
for their ballot extractor uh, devices. These uh, on screen are any additional maintenance contracts that the county would choose to uh, cover uh, this device. You do not have to uh, have the maintenance contract. Those are just additional items. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Thank you, Chair. Uh-huh. Vice Chairman Robinson. Thank you. Uh, Director Kidd, all right, so we got a ballot extractor. Uh, I wonder who came up with that witty invention and got that contract. And, uh, good for them in, 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 in today's time. So let's, 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 how many ballots are, what is the, what is the production or output of this? In other words, how many ballots will it read? Well, it's, it's not a reading uh, ballot well, at all. Uh, the, ballot extraction, the, the ballot extraction rate is 2000 per hour. All right, 2000 an hour. That's also good for 2000 an hour. So 10000 a day. All right, so, yeah. all right, so how, many, how many ballots have we received? Dropbox, whatever, just estimate. This is just all oh. academic and theory. I'm not trying to box uh, in any way. Uh, yep. For this for this current election, we've uh, received back in eighteen thousand twenty one dollars. Eighteen thousand, so twenty thousand just for easy math divided by two thousand is what? Ten. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? You did. Take, take you ten hours with this machine to, to open these ballots. All right, got it. Yes. Take you so so based on. Uh, the voting population of Douglas County, our citizens who may be paying attention to this, who may see this later, it will take you 10 hours to go through the current current pen, no problem. All right, now walk me through extend this. That's just to open the ballots. Mm -hmm. Now talk me through the production, which is how long does it take now to scan the ballots? How does it, give me an idea. Okay, right now, right now that opening of ballots is done by individuals that are individually opening uh, these ballots. The state, uh, because of the large number of uh, ballots that counties have received, has extended uh, the ruling for these past two elections to allow us to begin to open absentee ballots. Right now, with straight manpower, what uh, what would take us two two to three weeks to do can be done in ten hours. Right, and that's just to open. But then, what happens once I open it? Where does that once, once that where? ballot is open, then it goes to a separate scanning team. That uh, those scanning teams, well, the openers put them back into batches of 50, <coughs> then they are scanned uh, into a scanning system. That piece will still remain the same. This is essentially using uh, this machine to eliminate the hand process of opening and extracting the ballot. I got you. All right, so we, we open it, no problems, it's all good. So we got it. We got we got it. We got a, a device that can open. Great. And uh, for those who out there have a process flow mindset, I'm I'm just process flow, right? So, the, the, you know the circles and the squares and the trapezoids. Those people who know how to do process flow. So I'm just thinking through this. So all right. So we opened it. My next step is it's got to read it. So I've got ten thousand. I can do all everything. I, I, this is good academic. Twenty thousand. Ten hours to finish it. Open it. The next step is I've got to scan. It. So I got to take those twenty thousand, roughly, and scan them. How many? How what's what's the productivity per hour for those right there? In other words, I've uh, now moved to stage two. The, the scanner can take anywhere from fifty to a uh, hundred dollars a minute. Oh, a minute. <laughs> so fifty a minute. Times 60 minutes is what 300 or 3,000. I don't know. I'll, 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 I'll need my second cup of coffee. But you said 50 per minute and the 60 minutes in an hour, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's 60 times 50, but that's 3,000, right? Did I get that right? Yeah, you All did. Right. All right, so I got 3,000 an hour. There's 18, that's six hours. All right, I got it. So just roughly. So I got to take me 10 hours to do this current batch, plus or minus 20,000. It takes me another six hours to, to process through um, this, uh, um, um, you know, put scanning, uh, putting them input. Uh, got it. So once I've done that, is there anything else that the team has to touch or do 
to calculate the ballot, or is it all now technology? Those two steps, well, it, opening, scanning, talk to us. It's op opening, scanning, then uh, you bring the parties involved with, because any ballots that the machine has uh, indicated that were improperly filled out, then the human component is back into the situation. We have uh, what's called the vote review panel. The vote review panel consists of both political parties that review uh, the ballots that have been scanned in, and anyone, uh, people, it tells you to bubble in so people can make check marks or make any uh, discrepancies on the ballot. Then, a, then the human team that consists of both political parties have to review those ballots. Right. But that's so not I on the computer. Quality control. That's your quality control. And obviously, you manage by exception and anomaly. I, I got it. All right. So the things to kick out. You got to go over there and look at, okay, how many eggs are spoiled? How many cracked? How many, okay, I got it. All right. So you, I get it. So third step is I now have to go through this process. So out of every ballot, what is, what is, and I'm sure you'd appreciate this, how, how many are, 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 don't make that threshold? In other words, they, they get kicked out. So, what percentage? I mean, you think about for, six, six. For every, for every thousand ballots, probably about 300 are voters that uh, either have what's called an overvote or undervote. An overvote is they filled in too many things. You have a stray mark on there. You have uh, done check marks instead of uh, bubbling in. So I would say for every thousand hand marked ballots, 300 have to be reviewed. Wow. 30%? Woo. I get it. It, it. it is a manual. I, I understand versus the touch. This, 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 I get it. It's like, wow. But the Ooh. only thing about that is, though, now with current technology, even that review is a little faster because in previous years, those 30% would have to be hand duplicated. But utilizing oh. the technology now allows us uh, to scan that ballot in and to be able to adjudicate on the screen. All right, so 30%, all right, we, we scanned it. All right, on the screen, all right, I'm going to give it another hour or two to go, just another hour. It's 30% of 10 hours, I mean, three hours, another hour. So I'm up to 14 hours to now get through this whole process. 10 hours to open it, uh, three hours to, um, in stage two, to deal with sort of the scanning in or reading it. And the last one is your quality control, which is about another hour. So 10 plus. It's going to be more than a, another hour because the quality control piece, Okay, yeah. in, in your timing phase, the opening is the longest amount of time. Yeah. The second longest amount of time is actually coming to an agreement with what you're calling quality control is our vote review panel. The That's panel right. uh, consists of both political parties, and they both have to uh, agree on what their decision is of this ballot. So that sometimes takes uh, a little longer than, well, it's going to take longer than an hour. That's uh, the second longest piece because some people may uh, see, you see this check mark as a uh, indication of the voter's intention, whereas this voter said, no, it was over too far, so that takes. All right, well, I mean, that's fine. So I give it, do I get a one-to-one -one that is, is, we just double the second stage to three hours? I'm just looking for order of value. Uh, I, would, I would take the second stage to at least three to four hours, yes. All right, all right, so we're going to add, so 10 plus 3 plus 3. All right, so give or take, so we get through all three phases, 10, 3, that, that's 16. We're, it's okay. There's 16 hours from up here. It's going to take you 16 hours to finish the current. Uh, those that were dropped off some kind of way or mailed, right? These are dropped off ballots and as well as mailed in ballots. Is that accurate or no? Yes. yes. All, right, all right, all ballots. All right, all, all right. All right, so it's going to take that long. We think, and again, um, and, and my last question is that, can I still turn in ballots um, tomorrow, or am I done turning in ballots? If I decide not to get in line to vote, uh, am I allowed to go to a drop-in box or anything like that? Can you explain the process, please? You have until 7 p.m. now on Election Day to have returned your ballot. If you have not returned your ballot at this point, please do not use the Postal Service. Drop them in one of our 10 drop box locations. Those 10 drop box locations, I will have individuals at each of those locations at 7 p.m. on election day to close that box and collect any uh, absentee ballots that are in that box. Those ballots will then be transferred back to our tabulation center to be opened and started to process. All right. All right. So, 
All right, so, so recognizing, you know, first day versus last day, we know there's probably going to be volume. Uh, people will decide to like get out of line, perhaps. I, I, thought, they just, I, I thought I was gonna be in here, but I, I just can't go. Whatever it may be, are we, have we anticipate the need to be able to check that box it, uh, at the least midpoint, or are we just gonna let, we gonna just stuff the, the box? And no. I, I don't know, I mean, are, are you gonna at least we have will. somebody just, Done. Yes, we will uh, essentially go midday and collect the absentee uh, ballot boxes. We will then again uh, send out the teams to close out the absentee ballot boxes at 7 p.m. All right, that's good enough, Madam Chair. I, I've got what I need out of this conversation. Thank you, ma'am. I yield the floor. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, Commissioner Guider. Commissioner Guider, I believe you. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Director Chid, um, there are two envelopes. There's the inside envelope that goes in the outside envelope. So who takes it out of that second envelope? Uh, the same uh, team that's uh, cutting the ballots currently takes it uh, out of the second envelope as well. But with the extractor, the extractor is able to shake the ballot and cut through both the inner and the outer envelope and extract the ballot itself. Uh, if it placed in there correctly, I guess. Um, uh, in the tax office, we had a letter opener for all of our mail that we process every year. And oftentimes there were jams because the blade does get dull after it cuts paper for so long and everything. But um, what happens if it jams? Uh, are you still matching the outside envelope with the ballot? No. The, when, you're counting. You're counting the outside envelope. When uh, okay, this is how absentee balloting works. When it first comes into our office, we have uh, checked the signature of that ballot, and we've essentially given the voter credit. So by the time it goes to our opener team, they're physically just opening uh, the ballot. They don't necessarily have to maintain uh, them with the uh, the outer envelope has the voter's name. We want it to be go into a, a stack and be mixed up where you can't say that this inner came out of this outer. Okay, you said you're checking the signature. What are you checking the signature against? When you register to vote, you're required to provide a written signature. When you do your driver's license, we have access to your driver's services signature. If you have ever uh, voted before, whether in person or any time you vote or sign any piece of paper with our office, we maintain a digital uh, version of your signature throughout the years. So and we're required you, to by law to so check everything. So as these are being opened, you're verifying that signature against uh, no. a two or three files? Or no, before they go to an opener, the first step when they come into our office is to verify a signature and basically say this is a valid ballot. So you have to call each ballot up. Yes. To to look at the signature. Yes, ma'am. Um, so this um, authorization also calls with signature verification. So what is? Could you tell us about the signature verification software? This, uh, okay, that was a uh, erroneous part of this. Eventually, uh, we will come to you all to uh, do a signature verification piece to this. That's a component for a different day that essentially uh, the outer envelopes will be fed through another computer, and that is able to do what we are manually doing right now. But that's not going to be included right now with this piece. But as they're being opened, are they being counted? The envelopes, are they being counted? Because you told us at one time you count the envelopes against the ballot to make we, sure. We, we do. When we open, when we open the uh, outer, when we open the envelopes themselves, before they go to a cutter, whether that's a human cutter or a machine cutter, they've been placed in batches. You have to assign a batch number to each batch. So the state requires us to make our batches anywhere from 50 to 100. So essentially you would put this 50 or 200 in this batch to open, and then you put that batch back together. By that I mean you would collect all of the outer and inner envelopes, 
put your back slip back on those. Those fifty dollars will be uh, take, taken out. Those fifty dollars can be run through your scanner at that point. But the back slip uh, for that tax would essentially stay with those outer envelopes, indicating okay. that when you got yeah. If I go in to vote, I actually put my ballot through a scanner, so you don't have to scan those. You put your ballot through a scanner, but uh, those ones that are uh, put through the scanner, we do have to scan those. Part of our elections process, at the, uh, after the election, we do what's called a post-election audit. The post-election audit is the state tells us these batches, whether it's an in-person batch, or that in person that you came in to vote because there's a paper uh, version of every ballot that's cast now. Those ballots are put into batches as well. So it tells us to go to batch 76 and pull ballots uh, 13 through 8 from this batch. That can be an in person batch, that can be a mail batch, or uh, uh, provisionals if you had any provisionals. All your applications are batched. Okay, um, the Secretary of State mailed my husband a absentee ballot for this election, even though he did not request it. He requested one during the primary. Okay, we still have that ballot. Uh, what do we do with it? Okay. So uh, he, he, he did not vote in person one, since then. One sec. He did request that ballot. We can't disseminate any ballots without you requesting. He may not have understood that he was requesting it. I can pull his application and, and uh, show you this as well. On the application for absentee ballots, you have to you have two protective classes, elderly and disabled. Right next to those on the initial application, it says, if you meet one of these two categories and check this box, you will receive the ballot for this election season. So in June 9th, uh, your husband checked one of those two protective classes and got that out. He had, had surgery, that's why he could not go in. Yes, so that, that put him on to a, essentially a rollover list for this election season. If you no longer choose to uh, use that absentee ballot, in this case he's already voted, he can write foil, like foil milk, on the both sides of the outer envelope and write the word voted in person and drop that ballot back into our drop box. Essentially, when he came in to vote in person, we had him fill out an affidavit swearing and attesting that he was not going to use that ballot, and we've essentially uh, taken that ballot out of our system. But the physical ballot itself, you're required to by law to return that physical ballot to our office. They can write foil on both sides of the outer envelope, voted in person on that and slide that ballot into one of our drop boxes or bring it into the office. Any of the drop yeah. boxes? Any of the Any. drop boxes. We have okay. 10 drop box locations throughout the county. Those can be accessed on our website at CelebrateDouglasCounty.com. Under the elections tab, you'll see drop box, and that will show you with pictures where all of our drop boxes are. All right. Thank you. You're back. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, got it. Thank you. All right. If there are no other questions for Milton, we're going to move on. The coroner has arrived. Uh, Board of Commissioners, we, go, we, we will pivot back to uh, tab number 13, and I will read it. Authorization to approve part-time contracts with Jesse Fleming, Brian Byers, Rufus Hundley, and Dean Ricketts as deputy coroners, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, coroner Godwin, I believe you're on the line. You're on the line. Yes. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, the um, the replacement is for uh, um, Jesse Flemings will be replacing Chantel Flemings, and the other three deputy coroners, they are only backup for when we need them when we are out and we need assistance or. If one of the other deputy coroner want to take a vacation or they get sick or get hurt on the job, whatever the case may be, they are just for backup purposes only. Any, any questions from the board? Commissioner Guider. Yes, ma'am. Um, I thank you for that. You know, uh, anytime someone comes before this board, uh, they oftentimes they bring us data or numbers or figures or whatever. And
and unfortunately, a lot of uh, uh, Coroner Godwin figures have been incorrect. Um, I can I have it documented, and I'm going to run through it very quickly. Um, when she, at the beginning of the year, in February 14, 2017, she wrote us a letter uh, to show how uh, the county had grown. And so uh, she was uh, comparing uh, her figures to the figures of the previous administration. At that time, she said the previous administration did 249. Well, uh, later on in that same year, in December of that year, when she was asking for a budget increase, she said they had only pro processed 124 in 2016 to her 2061. Quite a difference in, in the figures. The probate records um, will uh, document everything I am saying. On, um, and by the way, her 2018 budget was based on her 2017 uh, overrun budget. On March the 7th in 2017, uh, Godwin, uh, Coroner Godwin came before the board and asked for an 81% increase in her pay and salary for her deputy. She stated her department had already processed in two months 73 cases. Probate office says no, they did 34. But everything, every extension of uh, trying to figure out what we should pay her and everything was figured on that 73 number, which was twice what she actually did. Um, she uh, has since then been before the board and asked for additional deputies and funds because the workload while Commissioner Guider, you're frozen. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Commissioner Guy is frozen for yes, now. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, Jay, well, I believe, uh, hold on one second. Yeah, you? we had to wait for her to come back, but. No, that's what I was going to do. I was just going to ask TJ to see if he could work with her to see if he could help her come back, and then I was going to come on to you. TJ, okay. if you could work with Commissioner Guy to see if you could help her restore her system, and then I'm going to move on to Vice Chair Robinson. Do you have a comment? Yes, ma'am. Have, have you yielded the floor out of respect? Yeah. Well, I'm trying to. I'm not trying to pivot past Madam Guy has floor, but yeah, she's, she's, she's not. She's not back. So let me just give her a moment. Yes, ma'am. Okay, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. Hmm. Lisa, if you could, clerk, if you could just give Commissioner Guy the call in number. She should have it, but just so she could call in. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Bear with us for a minute, uh, board of commissioners and citizens experiencing just a little, a minor uh, technical difficulty. So, so when are we coming back in person while we're waiting, Madam Chair? Are we coming back anytime soon? No, not at this time. Uh, December 9th, uh, the, the governor has extended the orders. And certainly we want to make sure we're inclusive for all our citizens. So right now we're still virtual. I know, I understand. <laughs> virtual technology is challenging sometimes but um in order to continue to protect us and uh, respect this virus so this is the best we have but she'll she should be calling in in a second we have access to two methods is she i'm is sorry she on the line? i just spoke to her and she's going to call in so she should be on shortly okay okay I'm sure the floor is still hers. It's hard. Yes. Lisa, going forward with what we can do with our commissioners, just make sure they have, uh, we email them the telephone number. I know they see it, but so she could have access if we, if we falter in our systems. Yes, ma'am. 
Thank you. Okay, she's here. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, Commissioner. Yes, Commissioner Gotti, you have the floor again. That's the second time that they've done that this morning. But anyway, uh, I will continue. Um, but you see that she gives us one figure one time, and then she gives us an entirely different figure the next time. She's since been before the Board of Commissioners for additional deputies, although she's just doing probably 1%, if that, of the work, but she drives a county car and runs on county fuel. She actually admitted on TV to Randy Travis that she abused her county car. Um, in the financial report ending December 31st of 2017, we had to give her an additional 80000 to balance her 2017 budget, but then before the books were closed, they had to give her another question. She came before this board a month ago asking for four deputies to be added, when in fact she has been working them uh, since March of this year. This is against the law. They have not been sworn in. They have not been bonded. The there are open invoices from these people totaling $9,000, over $9,000. She told us a month ago her department had processed 325 cases, but the probate office says no, they haven't. She, he's only served 210 cases to them, a difference of 115. What is going on here? I do not, I think there's to you, Chairman Jones, to show that it was it was inaccurate. Also, Mike Axley, her chief deputy, has already made not over ninety three thousand dollars this year. As I said, for them to be working without being sworn in, without being bonded, they are putting this county in a very dangerous position. And when we approve anything that is contrary to the laws of the state of Georgia, then we are compromising this whole board. We need to hold her accountable. This is uh, abuse, and when we approve her abuse, we are abusing the whole system. Perhaps we could take, uh, put her back on a per investigation fee contract where she only gets paid if she works. Perhaps her vehicle, which she does not use for work, should be taken away from her. After all, she has two county coroner vans that she could use. Whatever we do, we, we've got to stop rewarding her bad behavior by approving every whim she brings before us. We are becoming part of the offense and the abuse. While disrupting the procedure set in place to properly govern this county. And I just ask y'all, if you look at the um, invoices uh, that have already accrued for people that we didn't even have on the county road, if you look at that, you will find several double billings, several double billings. This is not the way to operate that office as the grand jury has said in the past. We need to look at this carefully because um, since she's already been working these people since March, she's really telling you she's snuffing her nose at, at the Board of Commissioners because she does it. This is the second time she's done this too. She does not follow the rules. so. Why would we reward her just by giving her everything she wants? We need to look into this further. And with that, I yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Guida, for being so eloquent. 
uh, with your um, dissertation. I appreciate you. Um, Vice Chairman Robinson, do you have a comment? Yes, ma'am. Um, mm -hmm. No, I, you know, you know, me and Madam Guy are land on the, on the same position that, that, that it's serious. It's like, ooh. Um, I think change is necessary. I appreciate her opening the door to this about the standard, about expectations. Um, while well, this is a, a peer, and she's elected, I'm not going to judge her in the place of, like, oh, hold on now. Let's just use that, that lens where it should be used. But I get it. But I appreciate that segue. Um, as it relates to paying our bill, as it relates to, you know, I, I'm listening to this, 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 this I'm like, but... I want to see, I mean, it, it's, we're, we're marginalizing it and, and trying to invalidate, like, you know what this person does. She doesn't do anything. And it, it's such a judgment. It's such a double and high standard. It's like, all right, uh-huh. And I disagree. I don't have to do anything to that extent. You know what this person does. And you know the atmosphere that has been treated to allow her to do her job to engage this administration. It doesn't do anything but obstruct and create this this facade. Uh huh. I disagree. I, I disagree with everything. I get it. Help her. Don't judge her because I can use the same lens back against this entire administration. Every I owe it down the line. Uh huh. And I'm like, okay, but I. Where's the help? Where's the support? I mean, she's only trying to help deceased members and, and, and pick them up and, and put them in the right spot and do the paperwork. But it's such a polar, polar, it's like, okay, really? I, I'd like to use that same, like, you know what? Let's use that same judgment back. The same exacting. Huh. I mean, it is called the pleasure of the Lord, right? Uh-huh. And I, I, I just, I get it. So I, I, there's my statement, but let's come back to what's being asked. These people are, are on demand, and it's only a per case per $175, $100. I'm looking at this like, okay, really, guys, y'all, like, this is $160. Now, this. Oh, Jesus. We're talking about, what, $200,000 budget. we got certain people make more than that inside. But she's got to run an entire office. And, and do the work that she has to do. And she's elected. She can, she can, she ain't got to do it that way. I hear for them like she don't got to do it that way. She doesn't have to maintain the prior lifestyle, the prior existence, the prior practice. No, she's elected. If the public wants to change that, then they get it. But I'm not going to get into that. Not my job. My job was simply just going to ask, will I, will I approve these people to make sure that she has on demand to be able to come in there and help and perhaps pick up a body, get it where it needs to go. It's $175 a person or trip or transfer or an investigation. It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, really? Uh -huh. Fixed by the the same standard. Help all thousand people that same standard that, that we're establishing. Let's, let's, let's be consistent. Uh huh. When, when it comes down to the awarding of stuff. Just be consistent. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to that though. Because again, this is I, I appreciate that. That yeah, the the, the change. I, I I get it. And, and to that point, the eloquence and the exacting is like, okay, I'm with you. One hundred. All right, so I'm I'm going to finish up on this. It says uh, I personally think that no, not think. We need to pay our bills. If these people have rendered services, let's get this queued up. Um, I, I'm wondering, like, well, why do we have to go through this? I mean, don't we have contracts and things in our purchase order that, that, but they're just for services rendered. Now, I get that there's certification that they've been sworn in. I'm gonna let that go, but I just simply want to pay our bills. Now, it's up to my my fellow commissioners if you want to, as far as going forward on demand, right? Uh, as far as flex up, I have no problem against that. 
Um, I, because again, what what got introduced was a whole this judgment of the office versus okay, but that's not the ask. The ask was simply, can I get three to four people to help me on an on-demand situation, deal with sort of this 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 you know, I may need them, I may not need them, and if it's on demand, it's on, on service, then it, that's really the ask. All of this other stuff, all that okay, that would pass that. Pass. And I go go back to seventeen. We, we, don't, we don't went through that cycle. So with that, that I, I know this has been, we've been waiting for this conversation. So we knew it was coming. So I, unfortunately, we're, we're politicizing a, 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 our perhaps a legitimate ask that I, I need support. I'm, I'm going to come back to the conversation where the administration, when they say, well, it's not my job to help her. I resent that. And I don't apologize for that statement. You were nervous. Uh huh. You were nervous. Right? It, it, it's the atmosphere being created. It's, it's time to move on, Douglas County. This, this, you're, you're trying to isolate this elected official, and you're, you're, you're circling her. Not I resent it. Uh. <laughs> Ongoing, it's like it's picking and it's it's, it's long and it's just look, look at what's happening like in our like come on guys, back that up. It's not gonna be the same. Ooh. And we're creating this facade. People are like, well, what's going like okay, really? It's 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 it's, it's over the top. Not to get the same thing to that prayer court. Oh, I could have just oh, I'm that guy. Executioner. Oh, please. Hush. I'm going to use that same way, the same language again. Oh, thousands. Oh, not me. And I'm listening to this. I'm listening to this. Like, okay, let that go. But okay, I get, hey, look, I get the first amendment. It go both ways. I get it. What are you talking about? No sentence. I get it. That being said, um, I, I've made my piece on where I'm at with this, Madam Chair. I ask that this go ahead and be put forth on the next um, voting meeting to be stood by you know, each commissioner to take their position respectfully. But I think we we did talk about this at the retreat. I think it came up uh, for those who were not there um, at our, our constitutional and state official elected officer retreat last week or a couple weeks ago. Uh, it did come up in, in, in sort of a uh, a public meeting, um, and this is just sort of now it's coming before the official board of commissioners for a vote, and so I ask that that again, continue on for consideration. It'll be up or down, yes or no. Mm. Madam Chair, I yield the floor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the other, from the board? You're correct, um, Vice Chair. We will take position on Thursday. Uh, be mindful that our uh, meeting is Thursday, board of commissioners, instead of tomorrow, which is Tuesday. Madam Chair, I got my hand up. Oh, I, I didn't see your hand on Oh, there you okay. are. I hit Bobby. Commissioner Guider. See, it's a little oh. different on the phone. I can't see it. Oh, Commissioner okay. Guider. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm back on Teams. Oh, but anyway, uh, okay. <laughs> I want to remind this board she broke the law. She put this county in legal jeopardy because she, they were doing investigation they had not been sworn in they had not been bonded as required by state law they were probably driving our county vehicles they were not even on the payroll so if they had had an accident guess who would have been sued this county we have got to hold her responsible forget about 2017 i'll forget about 2017 if Commissioner uh, Robinson will forget about the jail. How many times did he bring up the jail plot? So let's let's just go from 2020 to, I mean, 2020, okay? She hired them in March without telling us, without having them sworn in, without bonding them. They were doing things representing the county and they weren't on the payroll. That is a legal issue that we as commissioners should all be concerned about because she's dragging us into uh, things that we had no knowledge of. And it's our, that is our job, 
we're supposed to oversee the welfare of this county. So uh, if we go along with this, then we have become part of it. And with that, I yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Snyder. I have a few questions for you, Corinne. I believe you indicated that there are vendor applications out there, such as the previous administration had vendor applications for their coordinators. There's no such thing as contracts for the previous administration. This is something that uh, pivoted or moved into our administration. And I just have a question for the coroner. Do they have vendor applications on file? And what was your process? And if you could just explain that too. Just give yes. me uh, some clarity. Yes, they do have vendor's application on file. That was done before they started working. Um, with with the the, uh, app, the contracts that we have, they were, there were never any contracts before I came to office. It started when I came into office. Um, and I would I would like to say, Commissioner Guider, please respect me and don't put out false accusations about me about doing something illegal. If you would read Title 45, it says that I can, as the coroner, the elected official, can swear, swear my own deputy coroner then. Yes, they have been sworn in. Yes, they have taken their classes to drive vehicles in Douglas County. If you're going to do research on me and you want to file open records, please get all your facts straight before you come online saying what I don't have and what I have did. Because one thing I have not done is violated the law. Well, the probate judge says he has not bonded you. No, they have not been bonded because we are waiting for them to go through the orientation. And as far as the numbers, the probate judge would not have the numbers that I have because everybody does not have their death certificate designated from the funeral home. There are also hospitals that sign their own death certificate and we do the investigation. We'll look and you also, and we also have cases at GBI that we we can't do death certificates on. So the probate numbers would be different from our numbers. And I never said that 2017 had 200 deaths. <coughs> that is untrue. If, if I hear you correctly, uh, Coroner for Thursday, Jesse Flemons will uh, he's replacing Chantel Flemons. So that's a replacement. The yes, other, is it the other three or two? You mentioned two. It's three. It, well, it, 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 it's three. Okay. It's so three, it's, but it's only for backup only. Backup. And, and that, that was a question I had for our um, county attorney. I know this contract thing is, it, has become a legacy with this administration, and we're the only uh, really county in the state of Georgia right now, it's my understanding, that have contracts for for uh, coroners, but we won't, you know, we'll discuss that at a later time. Um, these are backup folks, like in surgery. We have a backup call list in case something goes wrong with the staff that's already in place, because we are dealing with life and death. Uh, with this, this is the bottom line is death. So uh, a backup call list is simply saying to me, these, these staff members will be utilized in the event that the people that you have on staff now, such as your current deputy coroners, only in that particular time, maybe somebody going on vacation, somebody sick, somebody you may need some additional lifting help, you may have a multi-car accident, you may have a catastrophic disaster with airplanes coming down, oh, anything Jesus. of that matter. They just simply as a backup. Is that correct, Courtney? That's correct. Okay. Well, I just wanted to have my facts before I take a position to uh, Thursday. So if there's no further discussion from the Board of Commissioners, Coroner, we appreciate your time, and we look forward to uh, taking this matter from Thursday. We're going to move on, Board of Commissioners. Let's go on to tab number 17. It's authorization to approve a change order number one, order number one in the amount of $8,454.90. And that's a decrease, something on a positive note, on the contract with Prime Foundation uh, LLC for construction for the Chestnut Log Middle School Sidewalks Project and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. <coughs> Director Valentin, could you share uh, with the Board of Commissioners about this savings? 
Certainly. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, we were able on this project to adjust the quantities in the field and make some modifications that reduce the amount of curb that we were required to install uh, by doing some regrading. So that resulted in a savings in, in the contract. Uh, the project is fairly far along and we anticipate that uh, we should be able to complete the project with, uh, without any additional changes. Any questions from the board or, com or comments? Pretty straightforward. We'll move on to tab number 18, authorization to approve the change order number one in the amount of $8,915. And this is another decrease on the contract with the Corbett Group LLC for the construction of the Turner, Turner Middle School Sidewalks Project and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. <coughs> Director Valentin. Thank you, Madam Chair very similar in nature, adjusting the quantities out in the field, uh, making a modification to eliminate uh, a retaining wall uh, by doing some regrading in the field that resulted in, in the savings in this particular contract. Okay. Any questions from the board? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Vice Chairman Robinson. Thank you. I'll, I'll, the previous I'll question, the current one, Miguel, is, I'm just, just sort of a uh, uh, tie together. So sidewalks was just part of the supply. Um, and I was having a conversation with um, David Good. And, and by the way, put him on our official um, transportation committee um, just as a, a visitor, Miguel. But this is related because I, I try to line these up. So you've got this SPLA, and we've got a capital, a comprehensive transportation plan. Are sidewalks part of the comprehensive transportation plan, Miguel, or is it just truly big roads and bridges and stuff? Can you give us some insight? I'm, I'm trying to plan for the future. Yes, um, sidewalks are part of the comprehensive plan because they, they address all the different modes of transportation, including pedestrians. Uh, however, there, there isn't a, a real comprehensive inventory of existing sidewalks in the county uh, they will be taking a look at that, and uh, it is an element that we will look at, and perhaps there will be recommendations for additional sidewalks in some areas, particularly if there are either schools or other centers of activity that, uh, that would warrant it. Right, and so again, I'm just setting expectations of the public. We're not suggesting compliance, or there is no innuendo that we're going to go back and re-sidewalk everything. Sometimes you can't go backwards, all right? And, and so to your point, you're, you're gonna have some gaps, right? And you know, to your point, I think we're, um, our, and, and, I, and I know um, um, uh, Ron Roberts will acknowledge with our UDC and everything, our, our development code will get everything going forward. We'll have sidewalks, where sidewalk needs to be, where, when it comes to development, it'll be going forward. What we're trying to do is strategically retrofit. Is that is that true? about safe passages, Miguel, parks, schools, uh, to your point, um, shopping. Is that a proper way to, to, to frame this, Miguel? Yes, yes, Commissioner. Uh, centers of activity that, uh, that are, have gaps in the sidewalk, uh, and so we would look to improve connectivity. Uh, there are a lot of different locations throughout the county that could be retrofit, um, and so it will be looked into and uh, there would be some recommendations as to some of those locations being prioritized for retrofitting the site. And, and so again, um, I'm just going to drive home that point that there is a comprehensive transportation plan. There are stakeholders um, that are in play. Um, and, and so citizen input, input is important. Obviously, um, the sidewalk project that you speak of came out of town hall that, that our involved in and obviously got them on the list uh, advocating for that um but but likewise that's just me being in the moment and hearing the needs but sometimes you can take a step back and think long term right so we're talking about for the next three five years well let, let, let's 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 not act in the moment let, let's be strategic about how we're looking about our county and so i i, I conclude this says have you got all representation from um the various district um, commissioners, Miguel, to, 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 to round out this comprehensive transportation plan, uh, stakeholder committee. The, the last thing I would want is any of my peers to miss out giving input. 
during this process, and I know you got to keep this moving. We've got consultants that are on the grid, and I'm not looking for you to call out. But do you have 100%, Miguel? I, I do. Yes, Commissioner, I have 100% uh, representation. From awesome. The... All right, so we're all set and locked and loaded. So you're going to keep that moving then, right? And yes, to make sure that people, and when is the next meeting? I know you said you kicked off or sort of broke the initial, but we're moving. Tell us about that real quick. And then we yes, talk the, the, next, the next meeting of the committee will probably be early next year. Um, so, so we anticipate having meetings uh, uh, quarterly. Uh, so right. it would be early next year. Early next year. And, and at some point, you're going to come back for the Board of Commissioners to give a formal where are we? And how long is this assignment supposed to last? 18 months? Or how long would it take them? It's a total of 15 months. And so we will be making periodic uh, presentations to the Transportation Committee yep. and then uh, to the full board uh, once we get far enough along in the process. All right. So perhaps 15 months puts us give or take October, November, December. That puts us, what, at 2022? If I did that right. And so all things being equal. So going into the 22. Uh, 2022 budget there may be some type of strategic like there's planning right in other words this plan will give us something about the next four to five years is that accurate well the, this give? plan uh, the comprehensive transportation plan looks at uh, the future 30 years from now so Ooh. it will have recommendations and it particularly along major corridors uh, up to the year 2050 now this this uh, comprehensive plan uh, the goal is to have it updated every five years or so and the last time it was updated was um, going on 11 years so we are past due having a revisit uh, of the plan but the long-range planning will be to the year 2050. there will be recommendations in the short term uh, three to five years, and then midterm, five to ten years as well. Right, so we're laying down the plans. We're laying down the, the, the Thornton Road for the future. Right, the decisions I make 30 years from now, since I've been here 30 years, the decisions we make is going to take care of that generation that's going to like, okay, now, how did I get this Google and this switch and six data centers? And I, I know that they wouldn't have nothing to do with it. All right, I get it. That's how important this is. This it just has nothing to do with us being able to realize in the current moment, fellow commissioners. This is the same benefit that we got to pass, we got to cast for the future. And so I look forward to the input that comes out. Is but you know politics sometimes you get caught up in your, what you, what you get out for your current moment, but it, it shouldn't be about you. It be about the future and, and the, the great good of the whole of the county. And um, y'all are going to really need this, um, citizens and, and those youngsters that are paying attention that will uh, obviously hold our seats in the future. Uh, we're going to leave you something to work for, uh, work with as a legacy. That, that okay? Can we can we get one decision right? Can we all five of us get on the same page? At least get that future right. Can, can we leave them something that that's like like that, that they didn't have to ask for? It just showed up and it was like, boom! Like we got on that thought road. Like we couldn't have asked for a better hand. It's like we couldn't have earned that hand. Whoever was 30 years before us and made that decision, they put that fiber in that dark fiber that put us in place to get 4.5 bid out the pocket. So let's, 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 let's just get that one right, right? I, I, I get politics, and I, I get guys, but can we just get this one right? So Miguel, I ask you to keep us on task. Your wisdom, your experience here at the table is going to matter. And so I want you to think holistically to sort of like, you know, put the politics aside and let's just do what's in the great good of the whole. And let's lay down a good uh, comprehensive presentation plan deals with all elements of mobility and carry us forward. So that's your charge. You don't have to respond, but I think you get it. Madam Chair, I'm going to yield the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chair. All right, we're going to move on to tab number 19, authorization to approve change order number two in the amount of $19,169.92 on the contract with Summit Construction and Development LLC for construction of the Baker's Bridge Sweetwater Church High Point Doris Road intersection improvement and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin again. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this particular project is, is pretty far along. We anticipate within the next few weeks, two, two weeks, three maximum, it would be 100% completed. Uh, we uh, found that uh, we needed to patch the pavement, the existing pavement, uh, uh, within the intersection that was not anticipated as part of the contract. Um, some of it may have been 
deterioration in the pavement over time that uh, was not picked up during the design. Uh, but in essence, it, it added uh, uh, to, to the contract. This, unfortunately, is not a debuff, but uh, uh, also uh, there is a change to add some sod uh, based on the time of the year. It was felt that uh, it would be appropriate uh, to, once we were done with the project, that, that um, the surface would be covered and we would not be dealing with potentially erosion issues. Uh, so, uh, again, the project is pretty far along within the next couple of weeks, which will be complete. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? All right, I'm going to move on to tab number 20, which is our last tab for today. Authorization to approve an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Douglasville for reimbursement to the county in the amount of $3,480 in costs to be incurred for signal timing monitoring during the 2020 holiday season in the vicinity of the Arbor Place Mall for intersections under city jurisdiction and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This, this item we typically uh, enter into this agreement every year. Uh, we're actually looking at additional intersections uh, than in previous years, this time around, uh, because of issues that have come up with progression of traffic. Uh, so uh, we also anticipate that uh, perhaps the shopping season will not be as active within the mall itself because of uh, less people shopping in person. Uh, but the patterns are still going to be there and the issues are still going to develop. So uh, this particular contract is, is actually less than half of what it had been previously. And uh, this, the city has agreed or they're also considering the, the agreement to reimburse the county for half of it. So a little less than $7,000 total uh, for monitoring. Some of the monitoring is going to be done by in-house forces as well uh, during the day. And so um, in, the city will pick up 50% of the contract, a little less than $3,500. Okay. Any questions from the board? Pretty self-explanatory. Thank you so much. Director Valentin, thank you. thank you all of your hard work. Board of Commissioners, if there's uh, nothing else, no other comments at this time, I will certainly um, move to our county administrator to check to see if there's a need for uh, executive session. County administrator, Madam Chair. Yes. Yes. Mr. Connors, real quick. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be quick. From a finance committee perspective, Director Hallman, are you out there? Yes, yes, sir, I am. All right. Director Holman, we just came out of a constitutional um, officer slash state elected official retreat, and we're and and I know simultaneously or concurrently we're about to move into our um, the board of commissioners um, um, uh, budget cycle when it comes before us. Can you lay out the timeline? We'll go back to this morning, please. Just lay out the timeline that we expect to anticipate over the next. I guess we got four meetings. Give or take. Can you talk? Sure. To sir. Yes. yes, sir. Um, Budget retreat via Teams. It's going to be virtual, of course. Um, it's scheduled for next Thursday, November the 12th, and next Friday, November the 13th. Uh, that is where we will be presenting the uh, 2021 recommended budget, um, as well as going over some of our fiscal control policies, financial policies, tweaking those up, um, getting those um, updated. Uh, I've been speaking with David Corbin regarding that as well. Um, but after the retreat um, via Teams on the 12th and 13th of next week of November, uh, what usually happens is uh, we have a budget hearing. We're required to have one budget hearing, um, and that is usually the first meeting in December, which this year would be December 1st, because that's the first Tuesday of the month. Uh, that would be the uh, budget hearing uh, open to the public to uh, we'll give a short presentation regarding what was discussed at the retreat um, and present the FY21 budget at that time. Then um, after the budget hearing at the next scheduled regular commission meeting on the 15th uh, is when we are scheduled or looking at uh, adopting the FY21 budget. All right. So now, thank you, uh, Director Hallman. So, so again, this is more of the general information 
um, as we move into, um, in, in light of our current, um, um, what's happening in, in America and the broader uh, global perspective, um, sometimes we forget about where, where we are at. Um, this is our normal budget process. Um, and so Director Hall, when I heard you say it, it's just a single public hearing um, that's required, which is we've always done that. My next question is because we're looking at our fiscal policy, and, and this is something as you guys know, I've sponsored and I'm advocating this legislation that, that um, do we, is it, it's not an ordinance that requires public hearings. Is that true? Or is it a, a policy, our fiscal policy can be adopted just upon a single meeting? Please clarify that for yes, us. That is correct. Uh, any updates to our current financial policy um, can, uh, of course, we'll run through committee, our finance committee, um, and then we would be presenting um, those to the full board at um, a future meeting this year. All right. So to, to that point, um, I, I do plan on um, um, introducing at our retreat um, a draft of legislation for you guys to weigh in my fellow peers um, I, as you know your input and support to me regarding that fiscal policy and then we'll work with the administration director um, um, Hallman and, 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 and Madam Chair and, and, and uh, Corbin um, our financial advisors sort of refine this as we always do so that's a process so we, we got that so um, um, simultaneously as we go through this I know we're looking at uh, and maybe the county administrator can answer this uh, for Greg Hallman I know um, in our uh, procurement committees, uh, I know as, as vice chair, I know there had been uh, a desire to look at um, contracts and all of our contracts and stuff. So do we think that we'll get input going into this cycle or it, we may not be able to, because I think that the intent, the goal was look at, based on the military conversation, all contracts and where we can find opportunity, whether it, it, it's employment uh, contracts or whether they're uh, service contracts or what we just talked about right now, will we have a chance to be able to do that during this period? Do we think we're going to get input from our consultants? PVG? Yes, sir. Um, we have them scheduled to present on uh, the 12th. Okay. All right. They're going to be at the retreat. Okay, great. Yes, sir. All right. So they'll be at our retreat, so we'll get that feedback. So, um, um, okay, so that, that's on the 12th. That's the, what's that, Thursday? Wait, did I do that right? That's I think they're actually scheduled on the 13th, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they're scheduled on the second day, which is the 13th. All right, they're on the second day. Um, but um, anything that they present to us, will you have a chance to incorporate it into the budget? Like any learning that Yes, we hopefully we will be able to. They won't be entirely finished. Uh, this is a long process. Yeah, so I'm sure. It's a process that will take months. It, it may be a quick win yes, or something. Should have some information. All right, that, that, that's fair enough. Then I, I won't press that point. Which um, I, I want to come back to the earlier conversation. Um, we, we talked about judicial. Um, well, we, we got Judge McLean, which is more a longer term. We may have to consider housing, and, and again, anticipating. Well, um, Director Holman, I don't know if you were at the constitutional retreat or not, but we do have a new probate judge, and I, I, and I think consistent with this corner. Let's, let's be proactive and make sure that there's support there for understanding as they onboard, as you have these new electives, that the system must be able to accommodate, not leave you out there to figure out, but let's accommodate this new probate judge that we know that we need to have space for, and they may need to have a team. Uh, and, and so it's something that we're not used to transition of, of, of leadership, but let's, let's make this one a way more smooth, and I know that we can do this. So, I, I want to make sure that, that I, I want to see that probate judge inside the budget being presented to us, not as an amendment after the fact, as if I didn't think about this. We were told this, that like, no, y'all, we about to drop this on this judge. Like, I'm just not you direct home, but it, we, it was like, okay, well, you now have to absorb some responsibility that was shuffled out of the other places. And no, by the way, you gotta have this. And you, it, it's like, okay, I, I, I'd like to see somebody get ahead of this. I don't want this to be a mess. Um, and, and so, I, I, again, sometimes, and, and, and this is the part where uh, I, I, it's unfortunate with the coroner that, that, that I, okay, God, but it shouldn't have been like, but where is the, the support? It, it, it's, it's so, it, it's fatalistic. It's so, it, it, it's the harshness 
And he's like, well, where's the support? I thought we were all neighbors. I thought we were all like, okay, it's your turn. Okay, we do it. But it, it wants to be exacting. It, it wants to be like, all right, really? You know, that, that goes both ways, right? Without fear, it goes both ways. And I, I just think that we can do better. And I challenge any of y'all to go look at that state of the county. Like, no, we, we can do better than this. In some of this narrative, I mean, I get that it, it, it's both the adversarial to a certain extent. You want to argue, debate the points, but but not against the person. I mean, this this is so judgmental. It's like, ooh, it go both ways now. It's like they, we don't want that because it, it'll 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 implode. We'll we'll destroy ourselves. I mean, we ain't been hit that, but what? In all time, we ain't been hit number two seconds. And it's like, oh man, I just think the hearts of the people just. I pray that we can get through this moment. Not just talk about praying. I know separate two, but don't don't just don't don't come in here with the fake prayers. Like no, guys, you know this is not God. This this is this is ruthless that we would do our neighbors, and it just it's the language. Okay, if you missed it, I understand. Hold them accountable. I get that, but we're talking about the tone and overlay. That no, I've been here long enough to know that this is over the top. It is mean. It's like well, you know that go both ways, right? And it's like, okay, ease up. Focus on the process. Focus on the problem. But ease up off the, 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 the personal. We can do better. It, it, it shows that, well, where's the mental ascent? And you can rise up and, like, you don't have to be so low. Like, okay, show that you like, okay, come on, guys. It doesn't have to be that. Like, communicate. Show that we're advanced society. That we're not attacking our own, in our own sense. We could just do better. I just, that, that it pains my heart to have to weigh in on this but you know i, I have to because I, I i have the right to defend the first amendment then it's the second amendment you got the right to defend yourself but it's like come on back up what are you talking about Ease up down 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 everybody down everybody down. Here we go. all right let me tell you i'm done okay thank you so much commissioner robinson okay attorney bernard do we need to go into executive session Madam Chair, you'll need executive session for real estate and personnel today. And I'll defer to Mark about the sequence. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Bernard. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. So, pack it. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? We have a motion and a second. Um, when I call your district, please respond accordingly. District 1. Yes. Yeah. District 2? Yes, ma'am. District 3? Yes. District 4? Yes. Chairman? Yes. We have a 5 0 unanimous vote in the motion carries. We are, Mark, we'll take it from here and we'll wait until you tell us what to do next. County Administrator? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so close out this meeting and if everyone that's uh, supposed to be attending executive session, just keep your Microsoft Teams up and we'll call you in one at a time until we have everybody. That's it. So we okay. stay alive? No, close out this meeting. We'll call you in the next one. So you want to push the leave uh, button? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Just, like, just like always. Like the telephone. Yes. Okay. And we are live. All right. Thank you so much, TJ. And thank you to the citizens of Douglas County for your patience. Our executive session has ended. Our Board of Commissioners, do you have any announcements or anything to come forth uh, before this session ends today? Okay. If there's nothing else to come before this Board of Commissioners, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>